It's a positive film. It has heroes and villains, and uh, that it essentially uh, is a fun movie to watch. It's been a long time since people have been able to go to the movies and see a sort of straightforward, wholesome, fun adventure. Well, it's a fantasy. It's not science fiction so much as it is space fantasy. And it's about people. It's about, fin it's finally about people and not finally about science. The story when you actually put it into words is only so much nonsense to hang a great visual experience onto. It's the stuff that fairy tales are made of. Sort of boiling down religion into a very basic concept. Uh, the fact that there is some deity or some power or some force that sort of controls our destiny uh, works for good and also works for evil. Marvelous, healthy innocence. Great taste, wonderful to look at, full of guts, nothing unpleasant. I mean, people go bang bang and people fall over and dead. But, you know, no horrors. A sort of wonderful freshness about it, a kind of like a wonderful fresh air. It's got whatever you want it to be. It's a it's pure entertainment. It's like a roller coaster ride, and it can be interpreted as long as you enjoy it, which is the intention. Hello and welcome to Generation Skywalker. Um, I'm here tonight with Craig and Mark. Good evening, Craig. Mark. Good evening. Good evening. Boys, we're here to record a show which we alluded to during the introduction show about the 40th anniversary range, which you two were basically the, the brains behind what happened here. And it's a, it's a great tale with so much legs. So we're going to go right back to the beginning, boys, of exactly where the first contact and that was made. Yeah, there was a lot of backstory to this, and I know we've talked about this in various uh, formats of media over over the years because it was such an exciting thing to be involved in. But it's quite nice to, to look at it now with the grace of a few years, just to just to review it with the benefit of hindsight. And yeah, it was an incredible little tale of, as I said on the intro show, following your nose, saying yes to things. And it started. I mean, I've I've long been a fan of Helix. It's something that I remember uh, fondly, and um, was was lucky enough to get into. I think slightly ahead of the curve um, when it was still affordable. And yeah, it's always something that I've that I've championed and shown online. I think the displays are very eye catching and, and got a little bit of a cult following, as it were. I think Helix are unusual in in so much as they are one of those companies that had an uh, original license for Star Wars back in the seventies that are still around. When when you think of a lot of them in the UK, Lions Made, Clearo, Letra Set, you know, they're not really around there now producing those products. Whereas you know, Helix are still very much in the same part of the Midlands in the UK, producing stationery. So it's not um, a stretch of the imagination to think that lots of people might have been in touch with Helix over the years to sort of see what, what they had left from their Star Wars range. And I was no exception. I did contact them many, many years ago uh, and got into a conversation with somebody in marketing. They were interested and, and, and fascinated in the fact that this, this stuff was collectible and was fetching sort of high prices even, even for back then. You know, if you're in marketing one of these companies that, that have got day-to-day -day concerns in shifting product, you know, you don't have a lot of time to devote to the cranks <laughs> who send you emails saying, have you got any uh, drawings of Han Solo in your archives? So, um, so I kind of understand why it was no one's priority. I used to work for a brewer, Marston's Brewery, and Breweriana is, uh, you know, is a big collecting field. And we used to get lots of people contacting us wanting <laughs> the rare beer mat that they didn't have and, and all the rest of it and you know you're kind of you're polite to those people but you don't really entertain or get into conversations with them so I, I got in touch with them didn't really get very far with them in terms of the conversations and, and didn't think much more of it and then I was sat at work one uh, one Thursday afternoon uh, and I followed Helix on on Twitter and it was at the time when Twitter was it was very big and it was very interesting and fascinating and and, and distracting and um, Helix tweeted out this uh, this picture of an old Oxford math set 
with words to the effect of, you know, check out this old math set, isn't it cool? And I just happened to have one of my Star Wars um, Helix math sets sat on my desktop as an image. And I sent them that back as a tweet and said, you know, it's kind of cool, but it's not as cool as this one. And they were fascinated with it. They were absolutely fascinated that this Helix product existed with with uh, C-3PO and R2-D2 on it. And we got into a conversation in uh, direct messaging about this collection. So I sent them a few pictures and uh, of the display I had at home. They couldn't believe that they'd worked on Star Wars. You know, generations had passed and, and it had been lost in the mists of time. Well, they literally didn't know that that even no, well, done t- the line. It turned out, and I didn't realise this at the time, I was talking to their PR company who were handling their social media. So, But then when you got into the business a little bit deeper you know there were people in there who didn't know that they'd done star wars there were older people there as we as we as we met um later on who absolutely remembered it and uh, uh and could tell you some stories but you know the people doing their jobs in marketing it, it wasn't something that they that was common knowledge certainly so yeah this, this conversation with with the pr company continued online and i said look you know it was it was back in around october 2015 i said look you know force awakens is about to come out if you want to do anything with this on the run-up to the new star wars film you know everyone's going to be interested again you've got a great story one of the first companies to have it a uk license if you want to use the photos you know if you're going to tweet them out and put them on your facebook whatever it's fine i don't mind it's just it's nice nice thing to do nice association to have with the original brand uh, that produced this stuff and uh, sure enough, they went away, didn't hear anything for a, a month or two. And they came back and said, oh, we've, we've written a, a press release. Uh, and we just want to make sure that you're OK with this press release. Uh, so they sent this press release over. And it was just a little write up about the collection and about some of the prices that it fetched on the market at the time. And um, I guess celebrating their association with the franchise in a timely way on the run up to the, the Force Awakens. And it got picked up by you know, a few outlets. It got picked up by certainly local newspapers sort of around the Midlands. Um, but I think it also got on it was the ITV website and industry specific things like <laughs> stationery today or whatever it was. But it, it, it created a little bit of a buzz. And then I got a call from, uh, I think it was Coventry Evening Telegraph. And the Coventry Evening Telegraph said, we've, we've had a call from uh, the Museum and Art Gallery in Nuneaton. They're trying to get hold of you. They've, they've seen this article that we ran about your Star Wars collection. And they, they want to talk to you about perhaps doing an exhibition. And I was a little bit sceptical, but I thought, you know, what's no harm in having a conversation? So I spoke to them uh, on the phone and they explained to me that they wanted to borrow some pieces that they could put on display and uh yeah do a little a little star wars thing and they didn't really kind of go into much more detail than that and i did my research and it turned out that nuneaton was the hometown of gareth edwards and it was their way of just shining a little bit of a star wars spotlight on uh, on nuneaton as a you know small north warwickshire town which i thought was really sweet i mean how could you how could you say no and I think geographically it was kind of nice. I mean, it's not a million miles away from Colville and Stourbridge, which is where uh, which is where Helix um, are based. Uh, they've always been based in that that area. I thought it was it was kind of nice. You know, it's not a glamorous part of the UK by any stretch, but it sort of had this vintage Star Wars heritage that was just nice to um, nice to sort of shine a light on. I think so. I said yes anyway. I said yes, and I had all these grand visions of. Of, of putting on a on a show uh, and art directing it and um, making it beautiful. Basically, they just wanted my stuff. They wanted my stuff just to put on display in a way that they were happy with. So we reached a bit of a compromise. They had lots of diagrams uh, that I put together uh, as to kind of how, how this stuff should all sit and what went where. But one of the things I was really keen to do was to include Helix properly. And it was a nice opportunity to, to put the collection as it as it stood you know, on, on display in, in, in the completeness that it that it kind of is. But to have that seal of approval. So I approached um, my friends at the, the PR company and said, look, you know, this is what's happening now. This is what your uh, press release led to. How about Helix come on board and sponsor the show? You know, maybe that's a cash sponsorship. Give us a few hundred quid and we can do some nice posters. Or you could just give us some product and we could put it in the kids' corner and we can have some Star Wars activities and they can colour in with Helix pencils. And I just thought that was just delicious i thought it was a beautiful way of kind of bringing modern helix into this this vintage display that we had in Nuneaton. and they agreed they said yes so it was just really nice it was really nice to have their logo uh on the exhibition panels 
so that official seal made it all the more valid. So the exhibition ran for a few weeks. And the best thing for me that came out of it was we, we had a, a beautiful, beautiful note came over from Gareth Edwards. I think our mutual friend, Mark Newbold at, at, um, at Fanta Tracks had just tipped in the wing that this was happening. And uh, sure enough, we, uh, we received an email giving the show his blessing. I can read it for you if you like. Would you like that? As the director of Rogue One, it's hard for me to separate my childhood love of that galaxy far, far away from my many years of growing up in in Nuneaton. So it's a real honour that Nuneaton Museum and Art Gallery are organising a free exhibition of Star Wars merchandise in the year that our film gets released. Hopefully one day our memorabilia will earn a place in people's hearts like these have. Gareth Edwards, 2016. And to accompany that, we've got a lovely lovely, um, uh, message in the guest book from his mum. So meanwhile, while all this was happening, Grant uh, got in touch with us, got in touch with me and Mark, and floated the idea that uh, we should do a collector's track presentation panel at Celebration in London that year. And of course, me and Mark said yes. Yes, we did, mate. We, we, we didn't look back, really, because um, it was from that and working on the um, collecting track which was just a fantastic experience, I have to say. It was just great to be able to put into words and pictures uh, an area of collecting, uh, vintage collecting, that was starting to get more and more uh, exposure, more popular. It had always been quite niche, but now it was becoming part of a, you know, a bit a bigger area of vintage collecting and it was just great to work on with Craig and Grant and uh, we put together this presentation and the um, the presentation was full wasn't it it was absolutely packed it was it's also fair to say that we did we didn't really know each other at the time no I mean uh, to be fair it was your it was Craig's pictures that I discovered on Google Images that inspired me to collect helix uh, a friend of mine lee bullock he'd got the uh, the pencil box with the original sleeve and when i was around his house one day looking at his collection i saw this pencil box and it just you know when you see something and it ignites a really intense memory of something and it just uh, i just thought oh my god i've got to get one of these pencil boxes because as a child i remember having the colored pencils and some of the letter set uh, exercise books And uh, I I distinctly remember seeing the pencil boxes in my local newsagents. And from there, I went on, you know, got back home, went online, had a look at at the images. And it was Craig's collection that inspired me to say, right, okay, I need to start looking now at getting a Helix collection together. Uh, And unbeknownst to me, obviously, it was Craig's collection online. And what a fantastic collection it, it was. It's just absolutely amazing. And uh, from there, we got in touch and we got to know one another. We, we, yeah. we ended up working on the collection track together. And I think I think I'm right in saying Grant had done a sort of prototype talk. Like uh, he'd sort of done the initial groundwork for this and given a talk at Farthest From on Helix. That was right, yeah. Um, and he reached out to me to get images for that, I, I remember. This was sort of part two of that, just taking that, building on that, putting the team together. And I think also as as a sort of uh, as a fallout from that meeting uh, of minds, the um, uh, Beyond the Toys group was was formed. (laughs) It it was. It was originally it was UK Star Wars stationery and confectionery. That's right. That was the original name for the group. And that ran for about six months as it was. And we were just covering, obviously, Helix, Letter Set, Trebor, Lion's Maid, any UK license, basically. And uh, I think it might have been Craig Stevens who suggested we open out the the scope, uh, open up the scope of the group to to a wider range of um, licenses. And at first, I was re- I really didn't want to do it because I just thought, oh, it's going to be inundated with all sorts of crap and um i just i just i wasn't up for it anyway grant and craig we had this discussion and and both of those guys said "Mm, actually it's it's a a good idea and i went along with it and i have to say that i was completely wrong and um the beyond the toys group as it 
then became has proved quite popular and um, we've got quite a big following now right around the world and you know people seem to really enjoy that side of vintage collection because um i think once you've seen one 12 back you've seen them all whereas the beyond the toys group we tend to see different things servicing constantly from around the world different licenses from you know america spain sweden all, all the way around japan is the source of a lot of cool stuff but yeah from all the all the way around the world it's it's fantastic it's really interesting to see things that you never knew existed and it's a nice place to hang out it's pretty drama free it, it really is it's quite refreshing for a facebook to be able to um <laughs> go day to day without somebody being kicked off or uh, you know uh, some facebook argument kicking off it's everybody's relatively laid back and easy going it's it's great so yeah back to celebration we uh, we put this um, we put this presentation together uh, remotely between ourselves. It featured Helix, but it also featured Letraset, I think, and it featured a little bit of HC Ford, and it took in the the whole of sort of early UK uh, stationery. It was titled "That's No Moon, It's a Pencil Sharpener," which is uh, which is what Grant submitted originally. And we just covered it in a very, very visual way. We looked at all the advertising that was around it and we featured a lot of our own kind of tracking of what these items had had fetched on eBay. And I think that was a a big revelation for a lot of people. There were a lot of (laughs) open mouths in in the room packed room of 300 grown men looking at uh, slides about stationery. But one of the key things, one of the key things we did, and this was Mark's baby, was to kind of do uh, a little pause halfway through and, and look at what could have been if Helix had continued. Yeah, so we did um, uh, some Empire Strikes Back uh, coloured pencils. The Star Wars ones featured stormtroopers, and I did an Empire logo uh, with some Hoth stormtroopers on, um, and I did the Empire logo in red and yellow. Which I have to say, that's one of the things that re- always drew me to Helix, and where I think a uh, collection of Helix stuff always looks fantastic is no other range, no other brand is branded and designed like Helix stuff. It's completely unique. The Star Wars logo in red and yellow, so bold and vivid and bright, and nobody else has has done that. And you wouldn't be able to get away with that now with the way licensing and marketing works. Oh, God. Oh, crack. You know, you can't possibly do that. You have to use this logo or that logo. So everything starts to look the same. But back then, it it was a new science. And, you know, Helix... Now, it just looks fabulous, absolutely fabulous stuff. And what I wanted to do was recreate that vintage feel and take it further. So we covered Empire Strikes Back and we did some different pencil cases with different characters, some different pencil sharpeners. And uh, it went down really, really well. But it really got, uh, especially Craig and I's uh, sort of creative juices flowing. And we, uh, we really enjoyed putting that together. We did, and we had swag. We had. <laughs> we, uh, we 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 were. Uh, I reckon we had the best swag at celebration. Let's let's call let's you know let's just let's call it how it is. We had the best swag. So we had um, to, to commemorate our presentation. We had helix blue pencils with with, with the foil blocking emblazoned with the the name of the talk, uh, and then we created backing cards for them with a little bit of history as to um, you know what this stuff was and where it had come from. Yeah, it was it was a nice it was a nice bit of swag that was set the, set the bar for years to come. <laughs> it was beautiful. I was going to just bring that up because I wonder if you were going to remember that, but it was a stunning piece. I uh, have one right behind me right now. Well, Vader got his moment to shine because he didn't really appear in, in much of the packaging, so I think that's why Mark chose him. And, and you know, strange that. The main character, the, the, the character that every other licensee jumped on as being the, the, the main villain. Surely you've got to have Vader on there. He appeared on absolutely everything. Helix pretty much ignored him throughout the whole of the range that they produced. You know, he didn't appear on anything. So for me, it was a good opportunity to do with Vader. Because when, when we were designing it, we said, saying, right, what character are we going to use? And well, Vader didn't really appear on anything. He appeared on one of the pencil cases, didn't he? One of the vinyl pencil yeah. cases. But he, he, there wasn't a great deal of detail in the illustration. It was just like a black splodge. So, uh, yeah, it was his, his chance to shine. So while we were doing all this and being very, you know, proud uh, ambassadors for the, for Helix Collecting, um, I was keeping, you know, Helix uh, appraised of what we were up to. And, you know, they were as excited and enthusiastic about it as we were, because I think they just found it 
you know, a, a sweet little thing that was happening over in uh, in in London, and they were they were tweeting about it, you know, in support of us. So it was nice that re- that relationship was was building, and it was always part of the plan that we would go back and present the collecting track presentation to them as a business. And I was dead keen for that to happen, and I think we had to to rearrange a couple of times. Didn't want to let it slip. Didn't want to let that kind of occasion slip by. And I think we we ended up having a fixing a date for like the November, uh, so some months later. But they'd asked me in the interim to send high res scans of my collection, and they were very specific about which items they wanted. They wanted the the ruler, they wanted the pencil box, they wanted the um, each of the um, uh, pencil cases. And I remember contacting the guys on the chat and saying, "They've asked me for high res scans. I think we might get in the Christmas newsletter at Helix." <laughs> Well, they might do something more exciting with them. Who knows? But, you know, we knew something was was afoot. But but sure enough, you know, November rolled around and we we rocked up to um, uh, to present this talk to them. We, we had a few samples with us. I don't know about you, Mark. I, I was expecting just to sort of have a chat in the boardroom with three or four guys from marketing. Well, I, I've got to say, mate, that, um, you know, presenting to the warehouse staff when you got some burly warehouse lads at the back of the, the back of the room and looking a bit nonplussed about what you're talking about. It's um, it's, it's 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 it was <laughs> it was a bit daunting, to say the least, because I wasn't expecting that. I just thought it was going to be a few of the managers and directors and the marketing team in a, in a boardroom and we were just going to stand there and uh, deliver our collecting track. And it wasn't it was in it was in front of the whole whole place uh, the factory floor <laughs> workers the pickers the packers the, the drivers uh, the cleaning lady was in there uh, the, uh, you know the, the catering staff it, it, it was the full monty so what kind uh, of what kind of number of people are you talking about there, there must have been about sort of like, what, what would you say 30 40 people <laughs> Yeah, maybe a few more. I mean, they're not a big, they're not a big company. We just, um, they have this, um, I think it's like a, every two months they have a, a company wide meeting and we were like the guests of honor. <laughs> <laughs> so you're thinking you're going to be there in front of two or three. <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, yeah. <laughs> but it, was, it was fun and they were interested. They were, I, I, even on the level, you know, when you start flashing the prices around, uh, they were interested, but everybody knows Star Wars. The cleaning lady knows Star Wars. The, you know, the guys on the floor list know Star Wars. So th- there was a, you know, they weren't looking bored. They weren't sort of like <laughs> looking at their watches thinking that I want to get back to my forklift. Yeah, it was it, it was a good natured, fun experience. And then afterwards, you know, people people kind of clambered around and looked at the stuff and, you know, were interested. And it was then that they revealed that, yes, they'd been talking to Disney um, and Disney had given them permission or they got the license to do this revisited 40th anniversary range which we were very giddy about i remember coming out of that 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 meeting thinking oh my god we're going to see new helix stuff on the shelves and and then it hit me that i hoped god they're not going to just reissue the original designs because if they do that then there could be some issues with uh, how it's going to affect vintage collection of, of Helix prices, um, availability and all the rest of it, and, and also how it's viewed. Because certain lines, like, say, let's let's take Transformers, for instance. You know, Transformers are reissued and in, in, box, in different formats all the time. And collectors buy it. This is a different thing. I just felt that if it, we were on slightly dodgy ground, I, I felt, and I was I was excited, and yet I was also concerned. I don't know if you felt the same way, Craig. Yeah, I did, but I also saw it as an opportunity to stay involved, and this is where this is where kind of hustling and flogging your puddings comes in, you know. So I didn't want to leave that room without just cementing that relationship a little bit further, and obviously we, as, as part of our introduction. I was very keen that we all had a little slide each that explained what we did in our day jobs. So obviously I work in, um, you know, design, advertising, marketing. Mark works in illustration design as well. And and Grant, we pitched we pitched as our media guy because he was at the time podcasting like a like a loon and he knew everybody. So we'd kind of positioned ourselves as a little kind of handy team to know. So I said to them, you know, before we left, look, you know, we're collectors. 
we do this stuff in our day job how about we go away and we think about how we might like this stuff marketed to us as collectors bring a few insights to the table and a, and a little bit of creativity and we can call it a pitch and you can you know see what we come back with and and if you like it great if you don't we can shake hands and walk away and we went away over over the christmas period and had a ball with it didn't we <laughs> I, I can honestly say it was pro- probably one of the best jobs that I've ever worked on where I didn't receive a single penny. Uh, you know, it was it was great to be able to sit down and say, right, OK, how can we create that vintage look um, with new products? Uh, how, how would we as a collector like to see this range extended so that it would sit alongside vintage items without looking like... Um, just the same thing reprinted or rebranded or just a, a, a reissue basically so we went away and we I, I really enjoyed it I thought it was great 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 fun and we put together and to, to, to be fair we could have gone a whole lot further than what we what we put in front of them as well there was all sorts of different ideas floating around but we had to really rein ourselves in and think well we don't want to go in there and just completely bombard them. We've got to really sort of narrow our target here and pick the cream of the ideas, you know, shape those into something really kind of that, that, that will excite them as much as it will excite us. And I, I think we really did achieve that. Yeah, I was very proud of the presentation. It was it, it was it was very well rounded. You know, we had a lot of actual market insights up front. We looked at we looked at kids. We looked at sort of you know I went around all the stationers in in town and looked at their displays. There was a lot of kind of background research. We looked at um, you know adult collectors where we saw this fitting. So there was you know it wasn't just as chucking cool cool stuff at them. And then we looked at the practical things. So we looked at things like, yeah, Mark was very keen to put some ideas forward for the packaging, mainly so he could stand his pencil cases up. <laughs> that that was key for me because I don't know about anybody else, but those final cases, final pencil cases are an absolute pain to display. Unless you're going to lie in flat, uh, they're, just, they're just horrible. They're so bendy, you can't stand up for anything. So I came up with the idea of uh, an outer box. It was something that they took on board. They they liked that idea and, and, and went with it. So uh, that that whole uh, packaging concept was uh, my idea. Thanks very much. We looked at those and we looked at little viral animations that that could you know showcase each of these products. Little kind of things, like little shareable bits of content that they could use online. We looked at events that they could uh, attend. We had a whole raft of ideas around merchandising just you know pointing at people like um marvel and even sort of british brands like the beano and airfix and how they've taken their old assets and reappropriated them on different products and this you know the helix illustration style is like pop art so we had a whole range of kind of apparel and um kind of schoolwear phone cases i think my favorite were the uh the nail art <laughs> But yeah, it was just highlighting to them that they were sat on this bank of imagery that had some real mileage. I mean, it turned out that, you know, their their licensing agreement with Disney didn't support any of that. But it was great to consider and great to put together. And we've got some lovely visuals. Um, we, we had some great ideas, didn't we? One of the, I think one of the products that we came up with, one, one of the concepts that we came up with was taking existing Helix product mm. and applying that uh, vintage uh, design to existing stuff and i think one of the things we came up with was um the r5 d4 pencil sharpener remember that one yeah. that was basically a, a, a little drum pencil sharpener you've been around for donkey's years i think you get them in like uh, seven up and coca-cola cans yeah. designs on them and uh, we added like a little um uh, r5 d4 head and put his body around it and uh, that looked fantastic uh the death star sharpener we put the um the thermal detonator design on that, you know, from Return of the Jedi that uh, Princess Leia holds in front of Jabba. We put, we did a, a sharpener in the, th- that style. Uh, that that was that was one of my favourites. But I think my favourite piece that we put in front of them uh, was the. Um, you remember the blind bagged mm. erasers? Yeah, genius. Basically, you know, kids love this blind bagged thing, don't they? You know, where they don't know what they're going to get and they collect. It keeps kids coming back. Uh, buying uh, the same thing time and time again. And we came up with the idea of doing different vehicles and characters 
on a razor. It's done in the similar style as the Helix stuff. And um, I could tell two or three a guy, two or three of the guys in the meeting, their ears pricked up because it was a, a low cost item for that for them to produce, and it was uh, something that could get the buyer back several times to purchase these erasers um but it, it was something that never they never went ahead with which was a real shame that's some amazing design things i've not heard of before there Have you boys still got the the images for the, for those yeah we've got yeah <laughs> we have. yeah I've got oh, it all i can feel a blog post coming on from one of you yeah oh, no that's <laughs> uh, that's definitely um definitely on the case because yeah, yeah. that would be amazing to see because that's you know you're talking unseen stuff there the r5 thing but what a great idea um, and like I say, we really did sort of rein it back a bit as well. We could have gone on forever. Yeah, we we, we blew them away. I think they were very impressed with the presentation. They, well, they weren't well. expecting it, were they, Craig? <laughs> no, not really. And in there as well, we had, you know, the continuation of what Mark had started on the collecting track with the pencil case designs. Which ultimately, out of everything, was the, was the one thing that they did um, they did take forward, which we'll talk about in a bit. From the pitch, we we ended up building a bit of a relationship with the guys in the marketing team. You know, had them go away, digest this stuff, think about this stuff, but then come back to us with actually what it is, what there was in there that they could take forward. And there were things like the the boxed pencil case packaging designs and some of the campaign work because they needed to promote this stuff. And we did manage to turn those into proper you know, paid work. But I think on the first on the first trip back, it was just it was a bit of a sort of follow up. We were we were chatting on in the boardroom. I mean, Mark, you tell this story better than I do. Um, um, they, they got the first product out. Yeah, they got the, the first product. And, and Craig, there was about. Uh, sort of eight people in the meeting talking about this uh, this this stuff and um, Grant and I were sat down talking to one of the, the marketing girls at one end of the table and, and Craig was at the other end of the table uh, sort of halfway through this uh, presentation and um, this marketing girl got, got this box out and uh, out she plucked the new uh, Death Star sharpness. Now bear in mind that we'd only seen flat artwork for this. This was the first products that we'd seen uh since the original release in 77 78 and out came this little death star sharpener and she said um, we've got a gift for you there you go these are the first ones these are the prototypes and she handed one to me and one to uh, grant and craig i'll never forget it just stopped absolutely dead halfway through his conversation and just just home straight in and, and came over and went oh what have you got there <laughs> <laughs> not, not wanting to miss out at all and of course she gave him uh one of these uh, prototype death star sharpeners which is slightly different because it was very much like a, a sort of salvador dali painting you know the uh, the round circle bit of the death star where the gun is that they couldn't get the artwork right on it and on the initial production run this round thing looked like it was drooping it was melting and it melted over the band so it looked like one of those Salvador Dali clocks that was sort of melting. And we, we, we've, we've kept out, I think, oh, I'm going to be buried with mine. Um, but a very, very, very cherished uh, item, that is. And I, I shall never forget the moment where she got this sharpener out of a box. And me and Grant, our eyes were like saucers. It was great. And then she started getting out all the other products. I think she brought out the, uh, the, the pack of pencils, the Stormtrooper pencils were next. Uh, I think she maybe got a, two or three of the pencil cases as well. And we were just like, oh, my, oh, my Lord. <laughs> can't believe this it was uh, it was fantastic great memory do you remember the um the pencil cases were on clear vinyl and they said oh they, they've got these wrong they've put them on clear vinyl yeah it's a mistake and we all kind of looked at each other and went well, actually they look better yeah this puts a bit of distance between the originals and these new ones and also i think there was something to do with the exams where you can't take solid pencil cases into exams they have to be clear is that right that's right yeah yeah, yeah. but i think we, we we were very keen that they kind of pursued that clear route just because they were different they were different from from the originals and and they really made that artwork pop yes it did uh, yeah i think those original ones were printed both sides and one was one way up and the other was the other way up but um yeah they showed us the flat artwork for the uh, uh for the death stars um on printed on the metal and it was a real trial and error for them to get that right. You know, they, 
you've got to bear in mind that they didn't have any of their original source material. Um, so they, they had to recreate everything from scratch. So all the illustrations were redrawn from the scans. You know, they had to sort of imagine the net that produced the, uh, the, the Death Star and sort of deconstruct it. So I think they had a few runs at that uh, to get that right. And you've, you've got to say that the original Death Star sharpener is rightly one of the coolest original vintage items from any range toy or otherwise just because it is so 70s i mean it's like a disco ball it's absolutely fantastic iconic uh, who else would have thought of splashing all the color uh, over that sharpener and i think in our presentation i actually redid the illustration of or redid the product in just gray which is yeah. how it should have been, yeah. which made much more sense. You know, it was a space station, it was grey, you know, it's, and we did a before and after. In, you know, what we got was actually this, and it was uh, all sorts of, all, all manner of colours, and it's just, it's just a beautiful thing. Little tiny thing, and I, I think it's rightly one of the best collectibles, vintage Star Wars-wise, there is. So one of the topics of conversation at this the second meeting was was whether we could tell people because we were all very excited and we we hang around with people who would get similarly excited that this stuff was going to come back particularly with the um beyond the toys group and um rather sort of savvily of them they said yeah you can you can go away and you can you can have the exclusive on this you can tell you can tell people that this is coming back before we do the press release so you know in marketing terms seeding it with some influencers was a very smart way to go and people were very very receptive to it weren't they i think they knew something was up because i think i don't think we resisted posting a picture of, of us also outside the helix sign the last time we've been but yeah i did i did capture some of the comments at the time and uh, you know people were excited to have this stuff back did they actually run with any of your art designs I think I was in a, uh, no, well, certainly not for the initial launch. I think they went with a couple of the concepts for the packaging. I'd originally done a, a packaging concept for the Death Star Sharpener, which of course was originally sold in display boxes, whereas that wasn't going to be the case this time around. So we had to uh, sell them individually. And I came up with a packaging concept for the pencil sharpener which, which was a wraparound piece of card only very small but it looked really cool and also the pencil cases which we mentioned earlier that originally they came in display cases now any retailer nowadays will tell you that large display boxes on shelves you know it's it's not always possible space on shelves is you know the fight for it is fierce so in order to get our or helix's product uh, more individually presented on a shelf we had to come up with some packaging designs and one of the, the, the things we came up with was a pencil case the pencil sharpener slight slightly different but the concept the idea was there with regards to artwork because they were using existing designs from the 70s that really didn't come into play until later on down the line and i remember the phone call because i was in the middle of the maze in chatsworth house and Craig phoned me and said, uh, you might be uh, interested to learn that um, Helix want you to do some new designs for some new pencil cases. So at that, it's just like, oh, wow, fantastic. That means that the range has gone down well and they're looking to take the line further down the line. And that's where I sort of, I, I, my mind was racing. And I thought, oh, my God, I can hopefully fingers crossed i will get my artwork onto a helix product now for me as a child using helix product uh being a massive star wars fan to then have your artwork appear on a product that you remember using when you were younger that gets about as cool as it can possibly be as far as i'm concerned anyway that, that you know i could die a happy man after that I, th I think it's um, it's probably worth pointing out that we were working alongside their in-house team. Um, so we met their their in-house designer, and you know it wasn't like they gave us the whole job to do. So we we sort of rubbed our, we rubbed alongside uh, what was going on internally, and we didn't always see that. 
uh, until it was it was well into production. So, you know, while it would have been nice for Mark to have been let loose to design the countertop display, that was that was done in house, and we were presented with that, and we were like, okay, well, yeah, it's <laughs> it's nice. <laughs> But what they did do is when it came to the campaign, they did sort of hand that over. So I got in the post a set of stuff to photograph. Um, So the first job was to sort of photograph this stuff so we could put it in the advertising. Because what they tend to do with these things is they do these sort of fake mock-ups. And when you look at kind of the Helix work that's out there, some of it, you know, the Amazon illustrations are mock-ups, whereas when we got hold of it we took the time we, we photographed it all the stuff in the studio spent hours retouching it uh, making it look like real product uh, as much as we could so um i was involved in sort of the first trade ad that was produced and this was sort of where we got to um be creative with the copy so in you know with, with credit to grant a slight rework of his um of his celebration collecting track uh, talk title that's no moon it's a pencil case became that's no moon it's space stationary which um ended up being sort of the headline uh bit of copy for the for the campaign but what they did sign off is they let us go away and do i think there was probably one two three four five six seven there were about, there were about eight different little animations that we created for instagram and uh, and social media that all played on the relationship between the product and lines from the movie uh, and it was just i was in my element i mean i had so much fun putting these together and there were lots there were lots that got rejected and we learned a lot about how an organization like disney like lucasfilm manages its brands Although in some cases, you know, it wasn't that consistent. So we would have rules like, so we had one where there's a crop of C-3PO and he's looking at the protractor. So the protractor's cropped off like it's the little um, uh, little dome of R2. And he's saying, don't get technical with me. It's a little technical drawing set. And that's quite cute. But we couldn't use that because it's sort of making the product personified with the characters. So we couldn't have HB1 Kenobi promoting the pencils and things like that. Um, but what we did end up with is like a series of, like I say, a series of eight. So we had the, the Death Star uh, zooming into uh, view and the animated type saying, that's no moon, it's space stationary. We had both sides of the ruler, which depict the stormtroopers, um, very Banksy-esque stencil style stormtroopers. And one side of the ruler would measure against the the other side of the the stormtrooper and the the line appeared a little short for a stormtrooper. Uh, We had one where the 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 compass from the math set would draw a circle with the uh, the immortal line. The circle is now complete. Then we had some other fun ones. We had like uh, somebody having a lightsaber battle with the rulers, which is rulers of the galaxy. And get this, get this. So Lucasfilm rejected one of the ideas, which was uh, Dark Lord of the Math, because they said it was a terrible pun. But they absolutely loved Tractor Beam. (laughs) So we had uh, we had the Falcon being uh, dragged towards uh, a crop of the protractor. And we'll put all these online somewhere so you can you can see see how they work because it's very difficult to describe them. But um, we had Imperial and Metric, little gag on Imperial and, and the measurements on the rulers, the pencils drawing a line with the rulers. Only Imperial stormtroopers are so precise. And then we had a fun one which we didn't even have any words at all, which was which was hand chasing a hand pencil case chasing a, a couple of stormtroopers off to the uh, off to the left and then being chased back by a whole load more <laughs> very simple little thing but they were just so much fun to do they were used to to promote the range online was the line always going to just be well i know mark uh, actually we've just said we've just covered this haven't we about thinking the line was going to continue but as far as i could see from a collector's point of view the 40th anniversary set sold quite well didn't it they did i think the, the issue came was uh, the, the issue that arose was um the line didn't kind of resonate with a lot of retailers uh, they couldn't get their head around what the line was all about uh, that was the impression that I got from Helix anyway, was um, they struggled to place it with key retail- retailers, um, which is why it probably didn't go as far as it could have done. And like I say, I, I was asked to do some new designs on the pencil cases and they had 
the intention of creating Disney store exclusives that these pencil cases were going to be sold in. So that would have made it even more uh, incredible to find these things actually in Disney stores. It just never went beyond a sort of prototype stage. In terms of the line back here in the UK, it went down very, very well with collectors. A lot of people hoovered it up, uh, whatever was out there. But um, after that, kind of petered out a bit. And uh, I think they struggled to shift the volume that they thought they were going to shift. A few things. I mean, Helix were always traditionally involved in licensing. And over the last few years, they'd, they'd kind of lost their way with that. They'd had a buyout from a French company called Maphead. And that stuff that they were famous for, I mean, they were famous for Coke can pencil cases. And, you know, you name a license, it was Helix had it. Whereas in the last few years, they, they'd sort of lost their way. And this was a way of them getting back into that. But I think what happened is they went to all the big sheds. They went to all the big supermarkets and said, oh, we've got some Star Wars pencil cases. And all the Tesco's and all the WH Smith's and Ryman's went, we've got Rogue One pencil cases sat there, you know, that we haven't sold. And, you know, we've got Force Awakens pencil cases underneath them. And I think at the time that Star Wars fatigue was setting in and the retailers didn't understand that this was something different. It it did come with an inbuilt audience. It it was a celebration of the 40th anniversary. It wasn't just that 199 cheap shit ruler and pencil and and, uh, pencil sharpener carded that that they'd been taking and that were that were all still on the shelves so i i think there was a there was a disconnect there with their usual buyers so it ended up in in places like independent stationers who understood it and, and to my mind it should have gone in paper chase it should have gone in you know forbidden planet it should have been in all those kind of places but they just followed their you know their their usual sales patterns and i don't think they had to take up and and these things are a volume game they had to order so much um as part of their making this viable so they did end up with quite a lot of stuff left. <laughs> yeah, I did see it start popping up in home bargains and stuff, didn't it? Yeah, you know, I, I think to their to their credit, their their products are slightly more slightly better quality than a lot of stationary out in the marketplace. But but to their credit, they they did make these things at, at sensible, you know, kids' school stationary prices. You know, I can't remember what the what the pencil sharpeners were. They were two fifty or whatever they were. They could have gone the route of beautiful cased, you know, special edition eight quid's worth of pencil case in a nice box with a certificate and all that kind of stuff. And they didn't. They they were very true to their their brand and they produced mass market stuff that if you wanted a pencil case for a fiver you could have a pencil case and you could use it and it wasn't this you know gold edition thing but they came a little bit unstuck they came a little bit unstuck with their, their limited editions so they they got the i think they got the license to do every character but they didn't want to do leah because they they felt that that she wouldn't sell so they produced a limited number of uh, leah pencil cases because they were allowed to but the intention was that they gave them to staff <laughs> so all these what you remember those fellas in the uh you know from the warehouse who listened to our presentation yeah they were all going to get this princess leah pencil case that they were told was going to be really valuable and to not put it on ebay <laughs> um and uh, and all the rest of it and i think what happened was they were really taken aback by the amount of collectors who wanted to go and i think was it was it 250 quid mark the box yeah, they, they shot themselves in the foot with that one because I think that that I know was frowned upon by quite a lot of the, the sort of hardcore collectors because basically the, the only way of getting the layer pencil case was forking out 250 quid for the display case, which was full of the, the, the product. And it was the only way you were going to get a princess layer case. And I think a lot of people felt that that was unfair yeah, it didn't go down well, that didn't. And it wasn't something that we advocated. It wasn't something that we suggested in the slightest. You know, they, they sort of announced that they were doing this. And it was like, really? And like Mark says, I know it kind of it ticked a lot of people off. It, it put quite it put some people off going any further with the line. And, yeah. I, and I know that for a fact. I can remember but, a couple of people putting putting together the um, pencil cases and whatnot and stopping yeah, when they didn't it, think they were going to be able to get anything. Yeah, because it, it, it wasn't a fair and, and uh, sort of proper way of, of doing it. You know, you've got to spend 250 quid to get this five quid pencil case. It just, to me, that is, it isn't, it isn't right, really. Yeah. And they shot themselves a bit in the foot. So it was a big misstep when 
when I think a lot of people were on side with it, you know, people saw it for what it was. It was a bit of fun, and you know, I, I'll never afford the full run of the uh, the original stuff, but this is quite nice. But then, then to go and do that, I think it did them a, a fair bit of harm. But what we did get to do with them uh, was was an event. So obviously they they did have a lot of stock that they needed to move. They also had these these two products that they, they'd not really talked to us about. <laughs> they, they did what they called the Empire and the Rebellion premium office sets, which was their way of kind of going, OK, well, all these Star Wars fans from the 70s have grown up and they all work in offices and they're all proper stationary. So they created the, these these boxes that I think originally started out life as light side, dark side. And you got a, a hole punch stapler and, uh, and, a, and a pair of quality scissors and and the, i think these retailed they're about 15 quid mark yeah i think i think it might have been a bit more than that actually mate they were quite expensive and they, they were yeah. after the gift you know the father's day christmas gift market so they they had these things as well which we kind of acknowledged uh we didn't but and i did some ideas after the vintage thing had uh, run its course i did some ideas of, of ad campaigns to, to shift a few of those but they announced to us after we recommended that they went to various shows they announced to us that they were going to have a stall at the um, mcm comic-con in london uh, and we got to propose some ideas around how we could make that more of an event more of a stand than just them piling up stationery and selling it off so the the two two of the things that we suggested one of them was to to build a um, giant pencil case that you could climb inside and and pose for photographs uh, in the hope that you would post them on the social which was great so I, a, a local display company that i work with do a lot of um, shop fits and a lot of uh, big brand retail display work um i got to go to them <laughs> with uh, with the pencil case to go we're going to build one of these so we built this giant pencil case and we shipped it down to um to the uh excel and had that out there and people were people were lapping that up but the other thing that we did was we had a live artist like you know like tops have uh, sketch artists doing cards for you um while he stood there at the store we had a we had a live artist didn't we mark uh we did uh drawing on pencil cases no less and uh, at first <laughs> I, I, I was doing just like several characters. So I was doing either Greedo, Jawa, or I can't remember what the other one was. And and then what happened was I was getting people requesting certain characters. What I was trying to do was do them in the Helix style, uh, which is quite a unique, almost rough yeah. uh, ink style like a marvel 70s style comic strip uh, illustration and uh, then i got then i started getting people asking certain characters so i had somebody come on out asked me for Leia, uh, somebody asked me for power droid imperial commander somebody asked me for a 21b car do you remember what i asked you for mark you asked me for size noodles i did well done <laughs> <laughs> um and uh, it was it was a bit difficult doing it there on the spot i have to say but a real challenge and i loved every every second of it it was such a great experience uh to be able to sit there and sort of engage with people you know there in front of you and what people watch you were draw on pencil cases which i've got to say that's got to be a first for comic-con I was absolutely in awe of watching you work. It was just incredible. It was just, uh, can you do me 2-1-B? And he just sat there and he thinks for a second and then he just starts. And there's no, it's an unforgiving medium, isn't it? <laughs> big, there's, big, the, yeah, there's no there's no room for error on a pencil yeah, case. Big, thick black pen on a on a clear <laughs> vinyl case. But then, but then people took them, you know, I think, didn't didn't they get them in the, in the box and people took those away? I mean, brilliant, brilliant one-off pieces and to my eternal shame i never got him to do one on the day i've got one blank case <laughs> found in a drawer the other day i've got one <laughs> blank case so you tell me what character you want craig and i'll do it for you i remember i'll, I'll hold you to that afterwards i remember ruining one trying to draw vincent from the black hole try, <laughs> try, trying to be funny <laughs> Blasphemy, blasphemy. <laughs> so yeah, that was. I mean, that was great. It was great to be involved in. Um, they had prize draws, which got a few more Leas out into the market, and uh, a few more Bens. I think Bens were Bens were in an, a limited number as well, weren't they? I think they came out a little bit later. But we had the prototypes on display. So Mark's yeah. prototypes were on display on the uh, on the stand. And who did we had? Fett, Yoda, Tuscan Raider. Uh, 
I did a fat, and their artist did a fat. That's right, yeah. Uh, my fat was far better. Of course it was. Because uh, <laughs> it was done in a proper Helix style. And I, I got that half tone absolutely bob on. It, it was that it, it was the half tone that makes those illustrations. It's knowing where to put it and how much to use. And I have to say, after that, I did ask, could I have the prototypes once we'd finished with them? And uh, they said, uh, oh, we'll, we'll let you know. And I thought, that, that's the last I'm ever going to see of those. Anyway, uh, I got a I got a parcel through the post about three or four months later, completely out of the blue. And it was these three pencil cases that I'd worked on. And they wrote, wrote me a really, really lovely letter, just thanking me for uh, the help on hel- helping Helix bring the, the range to sort of fruition. And um, as, a, as a sort of part of a thank you, here are the three pencil cases that you were created. And uh, these are the only ones in existence. So please look after them. I've still got them. Well, boys, brilliant, brilliant adventure from collecting something which brought you together. Like you said, you, di- you didn't really know each other at the start of this this journey. So look at you both now. Just look at us. <laughs> Finishing each other's sentences. <laughs> <laughs> Eating each other's spaghetti. Oh, no. <laughs> It's been a it's been a journey and it's a great great town. Like I say, you really uh, whether you collaborate together on it or something, a, a blog post is fantastic, fantastically needed because the advertising ideas, which I think I've seen before, and but and the stuff that wasn't produced and your those kind of things that they really need to be somewhere so people can can enjoy enjoy that journey and read through the whole story again. Brilliant boys, brilliant. So what's next then? You're gonna um, get onto Letraset? No, oh, what? We, we we have thought we we had the the question was asked. <laughs> we did what? actually say when the Helix thing died down and say, right lads, what brand are we going to approach next and try and get that back up? And we went through the whole book and it, it, the, the question has been asked you. So uh, yeah, watch this space, mate. Does, does, does Letraset still exist? Uh, I know they used to have a massive uh, big the part. The brand Kent. still exists. The brand still exists as a sort of. Yeah, it's 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 still going, but I think as a as a as a concept using pre-drawn, pre-animated elements and and allowing people to construct their own their own pictures and greetings and animations, I think I think the time is the time is now to to revisit the action transfer um, idea for the Instagram Stories generation. Well, that's a. <laughs> <laughs> one for the future for the listeners there yeah it's coming you heard it here first <laughs> but brilliant brilliant tale boys um really enjoyable and uh seriously people check out the website because i've got a feeling that blog will be uh quite soon after this show <laughs> no pressure lads no pressure mark craig fantastic uh tale it's been i've i've oh, might as well i've not been here I've, I've sat back and just really enjoyed listening to what you're both saying just kind of ready to go and buy some helix actually yeah well it's out <laughs> so, there it's quite cheap <laughs> well boys thank you so much you're very thank you, mate. Mate.